20-something years ago, I was born in Iran. I still have relatives who live there. Relatives who live in one of the least democratic countries in the world. By staying in touch with them, and also by keeping myself up to date about events in Iran, I'm constantly reminded of how very different my life could have been if me and my family hadn't moved away from there. Staying in touch with youngsters in Iran also makes me aware of how they're really wrecking their brains and exploring all conceivable options that can help them to get out of there and move to a country, pretty much any country, that is a liberal democracy. And why is it? Why is it that they're exploring all options to leave? It's because they want to have what we have, which is freedom. They too want to be able to express their opinions without fear of being imprisoned. They too want to be able to vote in free and fair elections. They too want to be allowed to dress whichever way they want. They too want to be allowed to love whomever they want. And they too want to be allowed to choose whichever God they want to believe in or choose to believe in no God at all if they don't want to. Truth be told, there isn't a single day that passes when I don't reflect on the virtues of living in a liberal democratic society. Not a single day. And this is a fortune I believe none of us should take for granted. To be sure, around the world, people who live in dictatorships seem to want what most states in the Western world already have, which is liberal democracy. In fact, people in other parts of the world even seem willing to sacrifice their lives in order to make sure that they, their children, and their grandchildren have the opportunity to live in democracies. The Arab uprisings that we saw in 2011 are actually great examples of the, well, universal desire for democracy. I quite recently actually spent some time in Tunisia, the country where the uprising started, and I was there to talk to politicians about Tunisia's transition from dictatorship. And I was extremely humbled to see and learn how these politicians were doing really everything in their power to make sure that democratic institutions are established in their country so that the Tunisian people can enjoy the same rights and the same freedoms that we already have. Most of us who live in the Western world today have lived our lives during ordinary times. Ordinary times in the sense that political life moves on a predictable course. There's elections every four or five years in most Western states. And without some exceptions, we already know the political parties that we run in these elections. We know about their political platforms, etc. So political life is quite predictable. There aren't many surprises. And there hasn't been for quite some time. And what's more is that we, all of us, have grown accustomed to democracy being the only game in town. In fact, for many of us, democracy is the only political game we know of. We don't know of anything else. We haven't lived in extraordinary times with crises and upheavals and revolutions. And most of us haven't lived in authoritarian regimes. And from this political game of democracy, we have also learned that everything isn't lost forever if the political party that we voted for doesn't win in the election. Because we know that in another four or five years, elections are upcoming again, we're given a new chance to vote, and hopefully this time around, our party will win. This is the nature of the democratic political game. And this constitutes the ordinary times that we have gotten used to. But things are changing. We are now departing from ordinary times, and we are entering into a new political phase, which has severe consequences for liberal democracy, such as we know it. Over the years, we witnessed how populist political parties throughout Europe, ranging from Poland to Hungary, Austria, the Netherlands, France, 
and even in the Scandinavian countries, how these parties have grown stronger. And in the US, of course, we saw the election of Donald Trump in 2016. Donald Trump, a uniquely unexperienced politician who got elected to the highest political office in the country, and this on a populist agenda with near to no loyalty to the Republican Party. And what makes these political parties and their leaders dangerous is that once they're in power, they start to dismantle the very democratic procedures that brought them to power to begin with. In the US, Donald Trump has attempted to undermine the country's democratic institutions repeatedly ever since he was elected. But up until now at least, the courts, the federal bureaucracy, the state, and even large numbers of ordinary US citizens have played a very important role in sort of restraining his authoritarian tendencies. Now, whether or not the US democratic institutions are strong enough to prevent democratic backsliding during the rest of his presidency remains to be seen. This is something we can't take for granted. In Hungary, on the other hand, backsliding has already occurred. Democracy is in fact being pulled to pieces in this country. Viktor Orban, prime minister and party leader of right-wing populist party Fidesz, has rewritten the constitution. He has dismantled checks and balances. He has made sure that most judges on the constitutional court are Fidesz loyalists, and he has taken effective measures to muzzle the press. So even though elections are still free in Hungary, they're certainly no longer fair. So by changing and sort of tinkering with the democratic rules of the game, the opposition in some of these countries can no longer be sure that when elections come around the next time, they'll even be allowed to run for office. And we, as voters, can no longer be sure that our party will be an option to vote for. So the democratic political game has altered, and many states that up until recently appeared to be stable democracies are now seeing a new dawn on the horizon, and it is not a democratic horizon that they are seeing. This political development has been shocking for many and less shocking for others. Political scientists who have studied people's attitudes towards democracy haven't actually been too surprised about the successes of populist parties in Europe, and they haven't been too shocked about Trump's election to the White House either. Let's have a look at some statistics when it comes to people's attitudes towards democracy. I mean, you would think that when you ask people whether or not they believe it's important to live in a democratic society, almost 100% of those you ask would say, oh yes, we do. But the reality reveals another picture. Research has shown that in the US, Two-thirds of the people who are 70 to 80 years old do believe that it is really important to live in a democracy. Whereas only one-third of the people who are in their 20s and in their 30s believe that it's really important to live in a democracy. Only one-third. Support for democracy is declining in large parts of Europe as well. The World Value Survey from just a couple of years ago revealed shocking statistics when it comes to the attitudes of young Swedes as far as democracy is concerned. The survey showed that among young Swedes, those who are between 18 to 29 years old, 21% would consider selling their democratic rights. These individuals said that for a smaller amount of money, they'd actually be willing to vote for another political party. The same group of individuals expressed that, well, democracy isn't that important. And 26% of the individuals in this age group even said that having one strong leader that runs Sweden without having to bother with having democratic elections would be a very good or a good option to democracy in Sweden. We're certainly no longer living 
in ordinary times. Quite the contrary, we are now living in extraordinary times, in times when democracy is no longer the only game in town. Now, how did this development come about? I mean, what explains this current crisis that liberal democracies around the world are explaining, yeah, experiencing? Well, political scientists have debated that perhaps the past stability of democracy depended on certain conditions. Certain conditions that are simply not present today. Three conditions are usually mentioned. To begin with, for a long time, traditional mass media kept extremist views out and slowed down the spread of fake news. Today, however, many get their news from social media platforms. Platforms that make it so much easier for extremist movements to convey their message to citizens. Secondly, throughout the history of democratic stability, living standards for average people have increased rapidly. And many people in stable democracies sort of hoped and envisioned that living standards would just continue to rise and rise and rise. But eco economic stagnation has slowed this down. So basically, many people feel that they're working quite hard, but that their hard work doesn't show on their paycheck. And therefore, they are disappointed. And they are disappointed with politicians who they feel are not delivering ever-increasing living standards. Thirdly, most stable democracies in the world were founded as mono-ethnic nations, or at least they allowed one ethnic group to dominate. This is not the case today. Over the last decades, most stable democracies around the world have experienced a lot of immigration. And those who are immigrating are demanding the same rights and the same freedoms as citizens of these countries. And some welcome this, whereas others push against it and are afraid of it. And as we know, populist parties have moved quite fast in exploiting this fear. So these are sort of the three main conditions that contributed to democratic stability in the past. Traditional mass media that kept extremist views out, increasing living standards for average people, and mono-ethnic nations were pretty much one ethnic group dominated. These conditions were present before, but they aren't present today, at least not to the same extent. So, the million dollar question, of course. Is there anything we can do about this development? Can the current crises for democracy, for liberal democracies around the world, be reverted somehow? I'm not sure. But I do believe that we must at least try. So what can we do? <coughs> to begin with, and this is for all of the politicians out there in liberal democracies around the world, get in tune with what people are experiencing as real issues in their lives and address these issues. Make your policies and your language relatable. And also, take responsibility which means be ready and be willing to govern in coalitions with other political parties, regardless of them being more progressive or more conservative in their ideologies. You need to do this in order to keep extremist parties out of power. Secondly, I mean, even though it appears that especially the younger generation are quite disillusioned by traditional politics, Getting engaged in a political party is still worthwhile because at the end of the day, we want to beat the Donald Trumps, the Marine Le Pens, and the Viktor Orbans of this world at the polls. So get engaged in a political party. And if there's no political party that pushes the issues that you believe are the most important issues to push, well then register to create a new political party. This is your democratic right. So you might want to use it while you still have it. And thirdly, for all our educators out there, from elementary schools to high schools to universities, teach our kids and the young people about democracy and what it is so they understand it 
and so that they too are ready to defend it. And fourth and last, for all of the defenders, all of the supporters of liberal democracy out there in the world, take to the streets, protest, make your voices heard, let it be known that the Donald Trumps and the Marine Le Pens and the Victor Orbans of this world do not speak in your name. I sincerely hope, of course I do, that by taking these measures, we'll be able to revert the current trend and save liberal democracy. But let me be clear, the situation is truly alarming. And saving democracy has to be a joint effort. I mean, for me, being born in a non-democratic society, I would never, ever, in a million years, have thought that I would give a speech about the virtues of living in a liberal democratic society and how important it is that we safeguard our democratic societies. But nevertheless, I am here now today to encourage you to do whatever you can do and whatever you feel is within the realm of your possibilities to do, to save democracy. Don't, do not take it for granted. Instead, let's try and join our forces to save it. Thank you very much.